This video was brought to you by the fine patrons on my Patreon page. These videos are totally ad free and if you like this content, take a look at the Patreon page in the description below and consider donating to keep this channel growing. On to the video. Oh fuck all you people, you know what you fucking losers, I hope you all fucking die and I hope the fucking Eagles never win the Super Bowl, go fuck yourselves. I'm not gonna do what you all think I'm gonna do, which is just flip out! I'm gonna keep a level head. I'm gonna look at this game, not as a sequel to a Fallout game, and I'm in a special position to do that, see? I thought it would be hard to look at this game without getting emotional and looking at it through the lens of what has slowly crept into the game series I've loved since I was a young little man. But the reality is, I had more in the death of this Fallout franchise after Fallout 4 revealed itself to be nothing more than a looter shooter. So upon getting Fallout 76, downloading it, and booting it up for the first time, I found myself hating the game for a little while, but after day one, while I was at work, I found myself sitting at my desk thinking of ways I could get out of work early so I could go home and play more Fallout 76. Now I didn't do that because I'm an adult, but you get my point. I wanted to play more Fallout 76, not less. I thought to myself, oh my god, what's happened to me? Have I, have I lost my identity, my dignity? What have I become? There's nothing wrong with me as far as I'm concerned. Just like Fallout 4, Fallout 76 is a decent game that suffers from terrible quality assurance testing, a dreadful storyline which is buttressed with a really fun gameplay loop of explore, shoot, loot, and craft. Am I supposed to hate this game simply because it's called Fallout? What if it were called Elder Scrolls Fallout Edition? What if it were called Post-Apocalyptic Looter Shooter? Should I still hate the game? So as a warning, that is the mindset of how I am approaching this game and this analysis. That's not to say that I love the game, because I think as you'll find, I didn't. But if you came here expecting me to rip this game apart because... Complete lack of NPCs in the game. There are no NPCs. There not being any human NPCs. It has no human NPCs. No NPCs. Then you're going to be disappointed. I will be taking as thorough a look at this thing as I can. Both the good, which I will praise, and the bad, which I will skewer. Keep in mind, this game is a game as a service, so all these nitpicks are subject to change if Bethesda decides to actually care about the game and patch it after launches, which, if their past is anything to go on, they won't. So let's dig in, shall we? I want to point out that before we start, that instead of comparing this to a Fallout game, which will help no one, I will be comparing this to established genres in order to figure out what this thing is first. To figure this game out, I will need to break down some of the elements of what makes a game an RPG or some other genre, and explain why I think those elements are important enough to explore thoroughly. So what makes an RPG? I believe that we should examine this question from two different lenses. The lens of pen and paper RPGs, and the lens of video game RPGs. The capabilities and limitations of both platforms, etc. So let's define a couple of terms. A role-playing game is essentially taking the act of acting or playing a role, and gamifying it in some way. Give the player a goal, allow them to create a character, or decide the actions of a pre-made one, and set them loose in the world and see what they'll do, all the while trying to nudge them in the direction of the goal and keep them on track. In simplest terms, a role-playing game is acting. Every choice you make for your character is like a director telling his actors how they should feel, what they should be doing, and where they should be standing on stage. Gameplay, in most games that are successful, are usually successful due to a gameplay loop that is satisfying for the player to engage in. A game like Tyranny has a loop that looks something like this. Explore, talk, fight, reward. Now, if that was Tyranny's only loop, that might be rewarding for a time, but players might tire of it quite quickly because if the only point in talking to anyone was to get a mission, the dialogue would be meaningless. This is why in a lot of RPGs there are multiple gameplay loops. So the exploration loop might look something like this. Explore, talk, fight, puzzle, reward. And the talking loop might look something like this. Talk, roleplay, quest, reward. The quest loop might look something like this. Explore, talk, fight, reward. I think you get the point. Every sub loop 
feeds back into the main loop of exploring, talking, fighting, and rewarding the player for doing so with money, experience, and loot. And sometimes the reward for engaging in this loop comes from a satisfying outcome in dialogue or a quest. Not all player rewards need to have a monetary value. What is Fallout 76's loop? Well, it's the same as Fallout 4. Explore, fight, loot, craft, repeat. In Fallout 76, there is no role-playing. The game neither encourages or discourages it. For the majority of the game, you get a quest, you follow that quest until you can no longer follow it, grind out either side quests, grind by killing enemies or events. Notice I mention a lot of grinding. That is essentially the game in a nutshell, a horrible, boring grind for resources. A role-playing game should also grant the player agency over their choices. Player agency means choice, but it also means the freedom to choose. Players have unlimited choice in a pen and paper game for how they accomplish any given goal, because their choices are only limited by their imagination, whereas the outcomes are determined by a series of numeric systems that govern success or failure. In a video game, the designer attempts to take into account player agency, but there is only so many things a game designer can account for before a player makes a choice they never thought would be made and either breaks the game or walks away a little dissatisfied because they weren't given the freedom to place a live rabid squirrel in a gate guard's pocket. Either way, player agency is a big deal for an RPG, and the more freedom you give a player, the better the game or game master is received by the player base. So let's be honest about Fallout 76. Does it give the player agency? The answer is both a resounding yes and an even louder no. In every aspect, Fallout 76 gives the player the illusion of choice. But in reality, there is no choice. In well-received RPGs, the illusion of choice is either not an illusion, and the real illusion is the illusion of affecting the outcome of events. Fallout 76 opens with one choice. Follow the mission, or don't. If you don't follow the main plot, you can run around the open world, killing, looting, and exploring. But you'll quickly find that you're either venturing into instant death territory, coming up against enemies far above your level, which isn't a problem if you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, but the game rarely allows for that. Or you'll find that you aren't progressing quick enough on your own. Exploration is fun at first, because there's that shiny new feeling of dopamine that keeps you going every time you find new stuff. That dopamine hit rares off though, real quick when you kill your first powerful NPC and find a shiny new powerful weapon or armor piece that you can't equip because you don't meet the level requirements. Level requirements for weapons are one of the laziest ways I have seen a game company handle balance. It is something of a set and forget solution that, once implemented, is one less thing for a designer to have to worry about. But it takes away the risk and reward from the game and makes everything that you can't immediately use feel worthless. In fact, any item you can't use is better off being scrapped for parts because the, by the time you actually get to the level to use it, you've already found better weapons and since your storage space is valuable because it is so woefully limited at the moment, Keeping items you can't use in storage is a waste of resources. All the risk without any of the rewards. Eventually around level 10 you'll start to realize that there isn't anything for you really to do in this world because you've got a list of side missions that are taking you all over the map and an incredibly dull main quest and if you aren't doing those quests, the grind becomes tedious and slow. A player's natural inclination is to go on a main quest. And this is actually the best way to proceed, not the most fun, mind you, not by a long shot. It's just that the materials, money, and EXP you'll get for completing quests far outweigh the fun you might have exploring. So once again, you have two choices, questing or exploration. Um, that was pretty fucking boring and uh, pretty passionless and listless. There's so much about it that's just boring as, as hell, especially the main story-wise neither of which are fun for any extended amount of time. Now, combat is rarely one-on-one. -on -one. Most of the time you're going against three and sometimes more than six enemies, all of which are firing guns at you or slapping you silly. This becomes a problem for two reasons. One, you overwhelm the player, and two, you have to compensate for the challenge by making the enemies weak. So when they do overwhelm the player, the player doesn't immediately die. This is a balancing problem to be sure which emerges when you, as a level 10, manage to kill a level 38 enemy by yourself. You start to think, okay, levels are just for show. 
You get cocky and start going off trying to take on all sorts of mob groups, but then you get into a fight with a group of mobs about 20 levels above you, and they melt you. And if you're following the main mission, this is bound to happen to you constantly, because the spawn system in this game is broken. I can't say for sure how the game handles enemy spawning, but from the countless hours I've invested in this thing, I can tell you that I suspect enemies spawn in depending on the level of the first person to enter that area. And some areas always spawn a specific level of creature. I know this because of the disconnect error in the game. I was doing the main quest at about level 22, when I had to go to a meditation resort to grab a key fragment. When I got there, the place was swarming with level 38 super mutants. I mean, it was packed with them. There was even a couple level 48s, and well, you get the point. Then as I was duping the key, the server disconnected me and I lost my progress. I reconnected, which put me into a different world, and when I got to the same resort, it was now populated by level 7 Scorches, with a few level 25 pluses strewn about randomly. See, the problem is, I had already used up all my resources and broke all my guns killing the super mutants and had to resort to melee with the Scorched. That saw me using up a ton of stims as I tried to not get surrounded. So imagine this scenario, you're off doing your main quest, and you, you get to the area you're supposed to get to to get to your next fetch quest, and when you get there, a level 50 plus player, he's already been there, and left all the enemies that spawn there without killing any. Now, you're stuck either breaking all your weapons to clear them out, running like a madman to the nearest door, or logging out and re-logging back into a new world to get a reasonable spawn. I've done this a lot in the 50 plus hours I spent with this game just to finish out a part of the main quest. And speaking of the main quest, let's talk about that garbage for a hot minute, shall we? This mission starts you out seeking out the places that the Overseer has been and finding out where she is heading to next. Essentially, you go from one location to the next, retracing her steps. The first set of missions has you signing up as a volunteer for the first responders. This interrupts the Overseer mission and forces you to spend an inordinate amount of time in one place running here and there collecting water samples to tell you what you already know from the interface, which is, this water is not healthy for human consumption. This quest is meaningless. The second mission has you head to a home in the same area to find another dead responder that will give you a mission for cooking steak. Then you head to a cooking station, cook the steak, and complete the mission. Whoopee! The third mission has you finally leaving the town and heading to the airport. There, you will find the Overseer's Log, and that tells you about the inoculation project, which is supposed to inoculate you against the Scorch disease. The fourth mission, and this is the real ball kicker of a mission, and a signifier of everything that is wrong with this game. This mission has you going to the AVR medical facility. You go to the basement and find out that, before you can run the test, that you need to get a T-fuse and a blood sample from a mole rat, a feral ghoul, and a wolf. This is when the nature of this game's quest becomes painfully apparent. This is not a single player experience. This is an MMO masquerading as a single player game. This mission has you travel one fifth of the map to get the fuse, then all the way back and to three different locations to get samples of each animal, unless you ran across them on the way. This mission is tedium gamified, and to make it all the more worse, you have to travel all the way back to the medical facility down to the basement where you started the mission in order to complete it. It is boring, it pads the gameplay, and worse, it is mindless waypoint hunting. The missions get so much worse after this. The fire breathing mission have you engaging in an obstacle course which isn't all that engaging, then delving into a pit of fire to hit a button, then all the way back for a reward, but the worst, and I mean the absolute worst mission in this game, is the mission for Alice, the punk rock Miss Nanny robot. She regularly has you traipsing all over the damn map doing some of the worst missions in the game for her, but this is in, and of itself, not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, by the time you get there, you'll likely be level 15, maybe 19, like I was, and the mission, it's not meant for you. That's right. The game jumps from missions that a level 1 through 10 can complete, to needing you to be around level 30, but preferably level 45 to complete. I say 45 because the rewards for this mission is a set of raider armor that only a level 45 can use. Wah wah. 
It was hard to tell what the level requirement was at first because the enemy spawning system is just horrible as I mentioned above. I was having an easy time of things until I did that quest at the mines. First problem is, I was only level 22 when I started this mission, and the mole rats, which group up in groups of 5 or more, were all level 30 to 40 with a mix of close range and long range. Even with that, I still managed to kill them, only after exhausting all my supplies and weapons again. I was forced to drop the broken weapons and procure on site new shoddy weapons, and sometimes those weapons were too high level for me to even use. Once I got inside, the mission was to find another key fragment. The issue with this is, the key is on the body of Freddy Lang, a level 58 glowing one legendary 3 star ghoul. If he hits you, he adds a ton of rad damage, and at my level, even with low level power armor pieces, he was shredding me. It took 3 tries to kill him, and the only way I could do it was by cheesing his AI in a hallway where he stopped responding and attacking. I would have had to call on friends to do the mission with me if that hadn't happened. So it's at this point that I realized that leveling was almost as slow doing missions as it was exploring at random. That's when I decided to call on some friends. The best way to level in this game is to not really play it. Here's how you do it. You exploit the terrible spawn system, and the terrible way this game handles doling out EXP, get a group of high level friends to run you through a high level dungeon crawl, get an automatic weapon, fire a couple shots into each mob, and you will gain about 10 levels in about an hour. It is a hell of a lot better to do this though, than running off by yourself and risking all your resources to gain a few more levels, and playing with friends makes even the act of watching flies and the act of coitus fun, so this isn't exactly to the credit of Fallout 76. The more you play this game, the more you fight, the more you have to struggle with the interface which is not set up in a way that makes quickly accessing items easy. Even with a controller, scrolling through 100 or more items to find the one item you want to use in a game that doesn't pause combat for you is an egregious sin. Sure, you can mitigate this by hotkeying items, but try hotkeying food and then using it and realize it only heals like a tenth of your bar. Using it for the purposes of healing once you've used up all your stims. Yeah, that's tedious, but it's also dangerous because you're not healing enough in time to not die to the 10 or 15 mobs that are shooting you all at once. Again, in order to accommodate for this, the mobs roughly around your level won't absolutely melt you, but digging through that screen still causes undue stress and makes you wonder why the hell, after all this time, it hasn't been changed. People have consistently complained about it, but Bethesda seems unwilling to redesign. This interface is more than a decade old at this point. That's right, this interface hasn't changed in any significant way since 2008, and this rigid, unwavering stance that Bethesda seems to have against improving anything they established in previous games continues on with Fallout 76. The most maddening thing is, when you change something like, in this case, action no longer pausing when in inventory, the inventory system has to change completely especially if it wasn't designed with the type of gameplay in mind. Take this simple improvement, which wouldn't even require the design team to redesign the inventory UI. How about food? Instead of having a million different status effects, it could be converted into a ration that has a base percentage healing and food replenishment rate. Doing this would create one item with the same base stats, not 20 different ones that have different pros and cons. That one item could be hotkeyed and used as a healing in a pinch. No, instead what we have is a system that has depth granted, but is buried underneath a terribly designed UI that was not made with online gameplay in mind. In most AAA game studios, we partake in an exercise called user experience testing. Grand idea. We invite people outside of the company, people who aren't up their own ass, to come in and try out new features in the game, or try out old features that we are looking to improve upon. They play the game the way we ask them to, and at times, we ask them to engage with an interface in the game that we are looking for feedback on, and at the end of the session, the player takes a survey. There are usually a mix of qualitative and quantitative questions on the survey. The researcher interprets that data, filtering out biases and taking into account variables such as confidence intervals and so on. The researcher then takes that feedback to the developers of said game, and they either change the element we tested to fit feedback, or they don't. They usually do, however. Everything in this game, and previous Bethesda games, tells me that they either don't do user testing at all, 
or they do very limited testing. Or the third option, they do a ton of testing, but choose to ignore the feedback. That third option makes a lot of sense because they ignore their own player base on a regular basis. Think about this. When Fallout 4 was released, what was the most common problem that players had with the game? How about the most common criticism that reviewers had? I couldn't get through a review on release day of that game that didn't mention how friggin' stupid binding bash, heavy bash, and grenade to one key was, and how the option to rebind all three functions to their own key was for PC players. This is such an obvious problem that they could have fixed, and a relatively easy one to fix as well. It's about six lines of code in most engines. It is low-hanging fruit. So why does Fallout 76, a game released a full three years after Fallout 4, have the exact same unmoddable problem? I think that Bethesda quite honestly ignore criticism, and it's to their own detriment. This would explain why bugs are not only persistent, but are getting worse with each release, but it also explains the laziness around the UI implementation. Everything about this game feels lazy from the quest design to the fact that there's no NPCs. Ah, God damn it! All right. I thought I wasn't going to mention it, but yeah, I am. The problem with there being no NPCs in the world makes it feel absolutely empty. This could have been okay if the player count was high and there were plenty of people running around in a world and if the servers were persistent in that if you created a character on one server, you could play with the same people consistently. That could be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, world assignment is random, and because of this, so are all the people you'll be playing with. If you can find people, that is. As of the writing of this video, Bethesda increased the player count cap per world from a measly 24 to a still mediocre 32 players concurrent. Now, take a look at this map and tell me, how often do you think you'll be running across another player? I can tell you it's not too often because depending on the level of the character, they won't be hanging around one place for too long. Without NPCs to interact with, the player is left with only three types of interaction. Shooting things, looting things, and crafting things. The result is that the world feels empty. And when the world feels empty, the missions feel pointless because who cares if we save West Virginia from a nuclear fire when no one is alive to benefit from it? Duh! Alright, what about the combat? Surely the combat is fun and engaging, right? Nah, bro. It ain't. Combat consists of two types, ranged and melee. Each suffers from its own form of mental disability, and some of it suffers from other issues introduced by certain enemy types. Let's talk about ranged combat. You know what I find fun in a shooter? I like it when I aim down sights for my bullets to actually hit what I'm aiming at. In Fallout 76, this doesn't happen because bullet spread is not eliminated by ADSing, it's only reduced. This leads to a hilarious problem I like to call, did I miss or is this lag? I did some testing and what I found out was, no matter how high my perception was, my bullets would veer off from my crosshair, sometimes missing the target I used for testing completely. The further back I went, it was even worse. Notice in this video that I'm not even that far back. In fact, I'm only a few feet away and the bullets still veer slightly. The further back I go, the worse it seems to get until I'm at a reasonable distance and my bullets miss the target completely. I say reasonable distance because this is about how far away you need to be to hit melee enemies before they can hit you. Everything runs like friggin' cheetahs in this game. And you also have to count for lag. I can't tell you how many times I've hit an enemy and killed them just to have them hit me afterwards be anyway because it didn't register in time on the server side. The game normally accounts for this, so you don't take damage but you still stagger. I also tested this with the glowing dot reflex sight. And to my surprise, the bullet spread actually seemed to get worse. The further back I went, the further away the bullets went. This is a problem, especially in a game where being able to aim accurately to hit fast-moving, erratic enemies is the difference between getting overwhelmed and killed or just losing valuable healing supplies. It's even more important in a game like Fallout 76, where you are often fighting creatures as large as a cat or a dog at knee level who are constantly popping in and out of the ground. So what I took to doing early on is whenever I got an ankle biter coming at me, I would pop vats real quick and shoot immediately. But see, there's a problem with this too. The problem with server side hit registration affects vats as well because for about a second or two, as you enter into vats, your chance to hit is always at zero. 
so snapping into VATS for a quick kill shot is impossible until the server updates your chance to hit. You're just wasting your ammo at that point. Melee suffers in a different but not unrelated way. There's something that just feels off about hitting enemies with a melee weapon that only becomes more noticeable when you do it in third person. You basically need to damn near be hugging an enemy, sometimes to hit them with a ski sword or a two-handed weapon. With knives, I can understand, but with a long blade? This is ridiculous. It suffers from the same problem that the gun combat does, in that on almost every occasion an enemy will hit you before you can take them out because you have to let them get too close, and even if you kill them before they finish their attack, the lag ensures you get hit every time. So what I started doing was, I started blocking a lot more. This reveals another problem that isn't compensated for. The enemies attack just fast enough that blocking is nearly useless in rhythm, and you must resort to prediction timing. Let me see if I can explain this. When you initiate a block, the game servers take a certain amount of time to register that you are blocking. If you use your reflexes to block only as the enemy is winding up for an attack, you will almost certainly be hit by that attack, whether you blocked or not because the server didn't know you were doing it before the hit registered. So the only way to block effectively is to try and predict the enemy attack patterns. The combat becomes a rhythm game essentially. I attack you, then block, you attack, and by the end of my block cycle you're repelled, I attack again, rinse repeat until you fall over dead. You could do this to enemies at your level or enemies about 20 levels above you. It just works, and it's boring. That makes the melee sound more powerful than it is because melee is made nearly useless in the end of the game when you start fighting the Scorch Beast. Remember the dragons from Skyrim? How you would get a few that just never landed and you spent the whole time shooting them with arrows? Well, that's how this Scorch Beast acts all the time. In Fallout 76, being close to an enemy means you're taking damage. Taking damage means repairing armor and wasting healing items. Wasting resources on repairing and healing means more tedious resource gathering and crafting. It is just not a good or engaging gameplay loop. You're always better off with ranged combat. I'm not saying that melee isn't viable, because it is. I mean, you can absolutely wreck house. But why risk the possibility of dying or losing healing items when you could sit behind cover and deal the same amount of damage over a longer period of time from a relatively safe place? So we've talked about exploration, combat, and looting. So what's next? Crafting. Well, crafting is admittedly good, but the problem, like most of the systems in the game, is the randomness of progression in the system. The way you unlock mods is by scrapping weapons that have those mods in them. That's the official story, however. The issue is, I've played this game with my melee character for over 40 hours, and I have never seen a combat knife with a mod on it the entire time I've played with him. There's two other ways to do this, which are actually much better in the long run. Equip the requisite perks for crafting, Craft a bunch of weapons or armor for the type you want to make, and then scrap them. These pieces do not need mods on them to unlock random ones. There's actually a percentage chance you will unlock mods for that type of armor or weapon after you scrap them. It's all random though. The crafting is random, the drops are random, even to the point where an enemy will be wielding a different weapon from the one they drop. The enemy spawns are random as hell, everything is random. The second way to unlock schematics is to go into an area where the enemies have weapons that you want. You farm them, and once you've exhausted them, log out and log back in so you can have them respawn. I mean, <laughs> repeat the process until you have what you want. It sounds tedious, doesn't it? That's because it is! Now, there is a third option. Buy schematics or mods from vendors. Issue is, those schematics are very expensive early on, and in my experience, the vendors never have what I'm looking for. Perhaps I just had the luck of the draw, which is the main issue with this damn game, the randomness. Now there's something to say for randomness when used sparingly and correctly. It can be very rewarding for the player, but when used so frequently for nearly every system in the game, it is nothing but frustration and grind for the player, because they never know how long it will take for them to achieve any given goal. They may feel rewarded when they finally achieve a milestone, but that reward diminishes with frequent grindy mechanics the more they have to repeat the tedium. Speaking of tedium, let's talk about the story of Fallout 76. Now a lot of criticisms has been levied at writer Emil Pagli... Pagla... what is this guy? Paglia Rulo? Good god, I'm gonna catch shit for that. Ever since the story of Fallout 4 came out. But honestly, 
I don't think any writer of any stature could have saved this game. Imagine being tasked with writing a compelling story that the player, the one experiencing the story, doesn't actually interact with in any meaningful ways. First, what is a story? Now I know what you're about to say. This guy isn't about to explain what a story is, is he? Yes, he is. Story involves people. Now, I know that there are stories where animals are the protagonists, eh, or society is the focus, but these are all stand-ins, for the most part, for people. Allegories, if you will. We understand story through the people in the story, and how they interact with one another, and the inevitable conflict that arises from those interactions. Without NPCs, there's no chance to become attached to anyone in the game that has anything at stake, so the player must create their own stakes or motivations for retrieving these launch codes. Those motivations are almost exclusively so I can get further into the game. Sure, you could be saving up materials to build that lovely home base to show off to your friends, but in a game where the world only holds about 36 people at a time and is populated randomly, the chances of someone coming across your sweeping palisade are near none. Claiming bases as well is nearly pointless because your turrets are... <laughs> Your turrets and defenses are useless against a patient sniper. Also, enemies like to spawn within the borders of your camps, and will likely flank your defenses, wiping them out completely from an angle that they can't turn around and shoot. So, the only thing motivating the player forward is progression, and if that progression is attained by story and not multiplayer, the story beats you get are not through interactions with people, but recordings of people, or robots that act like people. The most important element of story is the conflict. Even Fallout 4 had a conflict in that you were trying to find your son, even though that conflict was incredibly weak. So what is the conflict in Fallout 76? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I have no idea. In order for there to be conflict in a story, something has to be at stake. Usually, this is one person trying to attain something before the antagonist can. It would reason, then, that in order to have a meaningful conflict, an antagonist must be present. Antagonists can be anything, however. 1984's antagonist was society. The same with Fahrenheit 451. Without other NPCs in a game, the story does not have an antagonist in the form of another person or a society. The antagonist in Fallout 76 must be the environment, which has worked in stories like The Perfect Storm, for instance. Man against nature. The issue is, it isn't just the harshness of the environment that is the antagonist in those stories, the antagonist is usually a weather event, or a pack of wolves slowly killing a group of people. It's usually something the protagonists are trying to avoid or survive through. Fallout 76 doesn't have this deceptively enough. There's no one specific threat that is the main thing they are fighting against. It is literally everything. You against the world, and without a specific threat, the story has no focus. So who the hell is the player fighting against? No one! There is no conflict in this game from a story perspective. Yes, you are in constant conflict with various factions, but not in any meaningful way, other than shooty shooty bang bang ways. This story, because of the nature of how it unraveled, is all exposition. You spend the entirety of the game's story learning about what someone else did, doing all the same things she did when she exited the vault, following behind her for no other reason than because the game tells you that's what you have to do because that's the next mission. A well-written game or story keeps you watching or reading because you want to see how the events play out in the end, but the events we're following, they're not a personal journey in Fallout 76, they're someone else's journey. So what's the point? Well, that's the question that Bethesda should have asked themselves before they released this game. Think about this. I made a video almost a year or more ago where I stated that Bethesda stands on addictive mechanics instead of deep, involved gameplay, and that real designers like Obsidian actually care about something more than how to keep people addicted to the dopamine. I caught some shit for that video. People called me pretentious, while others fully understood what the hell I was going for. Some thought I was an asshole who was trying to brainwash people into not liking their favorite game anymore. But how about now? Now that Bethesda is fully leaning on that one gimp leg they got feeding the dopamine loop, how long are you gonna PECK THAT BUTTON? PECK THAT BUTTON, MOTHERFUCKER! PECK THAT BUTTON! PECK IT! PECK IT! Before you get tired of trying to enjoy something fully unenjoyable. 
For me, that time came after a couple hours of playing, once the hollowness of the experience shone through fully. This has been a rant from strategy and now that you heard it, don't buy this game.